Well, hey, good morning, friends. You know, as we're continuing in this study of Christology, as we're getting closer to, I believe, coming to a conclusion with these video devotions, in these last few installments, what I'm want, wanting to do is to highlight some aspects of Christology that we've been looking at in different ways, especially because I want you to have some insights into the things that I've had the chance to learn over the summer and I continue to learn even through this semester of seminary studies. And we looked at the prophet, priest, and king theme in Scripture. We looked at the significance of the cross, the centrality of the cross in our last installment. And so what I'd like to do in these last few times together is to talk about three, or not, but several words or really aspects of the cross, things that we are reminded of through and by the cross together. There's about seven or eight of these words that we'll look at. Hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them. But the first couple of words that I want us to look at today are the words of obedience and of moral example. If we look at the cross and we ask ourselves, what does the cross or what should the cross from Scripture remind us of? We would think of words like obedience or moral example or justification, reconciliation. A lot of these common buzzwords we might hear in gospel talk or in sermons. But I want us to develop a little bit deeper understanding of these terms. And so as we're looking at specific language in scripture that describes the cross, I want you to understand that these are not independent things. These are not things that should stand alone but rather this is all part of a cohesive whole, that these are all complementary perspectives of the cross. They work together with one another. And that for us to try to interpret the cross, which is one of these, does not do it full justice to all that the Bible has to say about Christ and the cross that brings our salvation. So, again, this morning, let's focus on two of these descriptors, that of obedience and of moral example. And let me explain what those entail here. So, let's look at obedience first. Now, this term is going to express Christ's perspective of the cross. In fact, it's going to be one of the categories in terms of which Scripture is going to define Christ's work. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. If we look at passages like Romans chapter 5, verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Philippians 2, verse 8 says, And being found in human form, he, meaning Christ, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 through 9 says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So the obedience idea is developed in Scripture. And the concept here is found in a lot of other places in the New Testament. But it's done in slightly different ways. It may not blatantly say the word obedient or obedience, but we see the obedience theme played out in different aspects of the New Testament. For instance, the servant theme that we find in the Gospels. Let me point out passages that highlight that. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Even back in the Old Testament, as Isaiah prophesied in chapter 42, verse 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. So there's a concept of obedience found in the theme of Christ coming as a servant. But there's also the concept of obedience found in the purpose of Jesus coming to do the Father's will. Let me show you what I mean by that. In John chapter 5, verse 30, I can do nothing of my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, 
for the will of him who sent me. John chapter 10, verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, talking about his own life. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. John chapter 12, verse 49, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. So complete obedience to the father's will. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 10, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offering and burnt offering and sin offering. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. By that will, we have been sacrificed through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So that theme of obedience is in the servant theme in the Gospels. It's in the purpose of Jesus coming to do the Father's will. It's in the perfected suffering theme that we can see in other passages of scripture like Hebrews chapter 2 for it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source that is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers saying I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not the angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of, of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So we see, again, obedience in servant theme, in his coming to do the Father's will, in his suffering, but also in his submission to the law. You know, Christ in Matthew 3.15, but Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. Luke 2.51-52, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and, and in stature and in favor with God and man. And lastly, in Galatians chapter 4, Verse 1 through 5, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So Christ is obedient, fully obedient. We see it in the theme of servanthood. We see it in him fulfilling the Father's will, in his suffering, and in his submission to the law. So what the New Testament is stressing for us is that part of Christ's qualifications as being our high priest and in being the last Adam, as we looked at in Romans 5, is his life of sinless obedience to the Father. And we remind ourselves that he did this gladly and willingly. Jesus obeyed the Father completely. He kept all the aspects of the law, and ultimately in his suffering, he took the penalty of the law for our behalf. And John chapter 8, verse 29 says, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Christ being fully obedient to the Father. Mark 14, 36, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible from you, for you. 
Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Christ fully obedient. So what that means is, is, is in Christ being fully obedient, it speaks of his being our representative, our substitutionary atonement on our behalf. It links up with the Adam and Christ concept that Christ is our federal head, that Christ's death on the cross was both vicarious and substitutionary. It speaks about him being our representative in regards to fulfilling all the requirements of the law. It also highlights the fact that we were completely incapable to bring about our own salvation. And as such, we have this desperate need for Christ. And Christ, as we look at the cross, he was fully obedient. That's what it means to see obedience when we look at the cross, as a descriptor of the atoning work of Christ. But the second thing I want to look at this morning is this idea of moral example. Now, please don't misunderstand what I mean by this or what I'm trying to say in this. I'm not trying to say that we look at Jesus and go, oh, look, great guy, someone we ought to emulate and follow. To a minor extent, that is true. But I don't want you to think that I'm purporting the same kinds of things that false religions would say. They would say the same thing. Often, a lot of false religions, they won't completely deny Christ. They'll just say, yeah, he's a great guy. He's someone we should emulate. A good example, someone to look up to, a mentor, a posthumous, uh, you know, someone that we could emulate. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what Scripture tells us. The thing about understanding and looking at the cross as a moral example is that Christ is showing us in his suffering, in his death on the cross, it is a supreme moral example to believers of what love, obedience, suffering, etc., what all of these things look like. And so in looking at the atonement, the death of Christ on the cross, it serves to us to see it as a supreme standard or example, we could say, of how our behavior should play out in our own lives and, and as we interact with other people. Let me explain this a little bit more from Scripture. As we look at Scripture, I want to first point us to 1 Peter chapter 2. It's a little bit longer passage, but verses 18 through 25 says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So as we studied this when we did our first Peter study, we're reminded again in this passage that Christ in his suffering, in his atoning work, sets forth an example for us in how we interact with others. Obviously, the greatest and most important aspect of Christ's atoning work is our salvation. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not pushing that aside at all. But I am highlighting where Scripture reminds us that in his work, he also gives us an example to follow. In fact, at the beginning of the Philippians passage that we're very familiar with, the mind of Christ, that's what Paul says here in Philippians 2.5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to talk about the humility that Christ uh, gives us as an example here in his life. In John chapter 13, verses 12 through 17, it says, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? 
You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not know God, Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this, the love of God, was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, here's the example, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. And two more things, both from Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 1 and 2 of the passage says, Therefore be imitators of God, as beloved children, and walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So you see that these passages are not downplaying the crucifixion. They're not downplaying what Christ did on our behalf for salvation. But in conjunction with that, it's highlighting the aspect of how we can be like Christ and how we live in the example that he gives us. Finally, in verses 25 through 27 of the same chapter, Husbands, love your wives. Why? As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. This is what it means from Scripture that the cross provides us with a moral example. Not that we should lay down our lives, although those are noble things. Not that we should, you know, oh, be this nice person or be this helpful humanitarian, as some people try to malign Christ to, to sound like that's all he did. No, the moral example of being obedient to the Lord, of enduring, of loving our neighbor, of living in a way that would represent Christ in what we do and say. So like I've said, no doubt, a lot of people have stressed this in a very subjective way. So much that they exclude all the other biblical images. That's why I bring these passages into play. They ignore these statements. They ignore these teachings. And so they just look at the atonement and they say, oh yeah, moral example, a guy lays down his life for other people. That's not the point. But we have to make sure that we don't go to the opposite extreme and, and not look at it at all as the moral example. But that's why it's important for us to stress the fact that the cross is a moral example to us. Indeed, it's supposed to be an influence in our lives. It's supposed to be a motivating factor by how we live, especially as we proclaim to know Christ as our Lord and Savior. Christ's death on the cross, yes, it should stir us and evoke us to worship. And in such, as we live out the gospel, it should stir us to moral action. It was part of Christ's objective work. Without this objective work of the cross, it would not serve as an example at all for us in our behavior and in our action. So friends, as we are looking at these distinguishing marks, these descriptors of the cross, of Christ's work of atonement, this morning we've looked at the aspect of Christ being obedient and as the cross serving as a moral example for us. We're going to look into some more heady words like reconciliation and propitiation as we bring this series to a close. But I pray that these will be words that urge you to study further, to learn more about these topics. Because again, I'm only able to give us kind of the bird's eye view here. There's so much more depth we could go into with each of these topics, but I pray that they serve you well.
and I look forward to sharing more with you next time.